Okay, thank you everyone for joining. This is uh, Roman Yankin from Palamita here. We are going to start uh, our webinar on how to protect your Linux-based products from open source vulnerabilities and IP violations. And we are very happy to have uh, our two guests here, uh, Chan Zhou, who is the founder of the law firm in Germany, uh, specializing in open source law and patent law. And uh, we're also very happy to have um, uh, Jeff Lush, uh, who is the founder and CTO of Palamida, today with us. Um, we will kick off uh, the uh, webinar uh, with uh, Chan Zhou, and um, I'm going to turn it over uh, to you, Chan Zhou, uh, right now. When mm -hmm. Please start. Thank you, Roman. So, choose which one of the screens, and that's the one. All right. Well, thank you, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm Chan Zhou. I'm broadcasting from Germany in Würzburg. Like Roman already said, we are a small law firm, only seven lawyers, but we are all specialized in IP, IT law, and we spend more than 50% of our build hours in open source matters. Uh, we work mostly for automotive OEMs and suppliers uh, with open source processes and also sometimes litigation. Um, different than other lawyers who are specialized in open source law, we never represent copyright holders or uh, organizations against industry players. So what, will we able, what we will be talking about today is the question, um, first thing we hear a lot of times is um, we have a process. We deal with open source and it has been sufficient because we never got sued. Why do we have to change anything now? Uh, do I really have to do open source compliance? And if I do, what are the next steps? So uh, this is a lot of text over here. The answer to the first question, why do I have to do some uh, things differently, is because times have changed. Um, so if your experience in, with open source has been from uh, let's say 10 years ago, five years ago, maybe the rules may have changed and you have to reconsider what um, is going on out there. If we started in 1991, um, that's the first era that I call the don't know and don't care era. Um, a lot of people were using open source. The uh, community introduced the GPL version 2 with Linux. Uh, there were hardly anything uh, at the courts. There were no legal activities and the OEMs thought that there is no open source software in the product. Uh, suppliers used open source already because it was free and did not worry very much about compliance. And uh, this changed in the second era that I call the era of idealism and compliance, where some developers and communities have started to uh, go after copyright violations, uh, like the uh, portal gplviolations.org that accounted for over 100 out-of-court settlements, and they were also responsible for a lot of lawsuits, a lot of those that happened in Germany, and uh, I know that uh, you probably know the popular case like Sitecom, Dealing, Skype, FMC, Pool Data. These are all German cases. Um, the OEMs, especially in the automotive business, still have the opinion: well, open source is illegal to use uh, in our product. We outlawed it, so it cannot be anywhere. And the contract just stated uh, any software had to be free of third-party rights, and that's about it. And uh, at the same time, however, they did not really look at what software came with the black boxes. They just bought black boxes units and didn't ask any questions about what software was in there. And at that time, everybody knows there was already a lot of open source going on there. Suppliers are using open source in infotainment. And now you hear I'm talking about the automotive business again. Um, and most of the time, they did not worry about compliance because there was no way to find open source uh, anywhere in the binaries. And at that time, however, some of the major tier ones, the early adopters already started their open source processes and um, starting to find out what they had in their portfolios. And uh, uh, a lot of tier ones, however, at that time did not worry about it. And that's when we came to the second to third era that I call the supply chain pressure era, where the pressure does not come from those GPL violation guys or the organizations, but rather from the supply chain, because your customer is the one that will um, 
force you or to motivate you to start an open source compliance process. Um, at courts, we have some lawsuits, especially the one against the VMware in Hamburg that's currently going on. Trolls that you know from patent law have entered the arena and uh, demand substantial license fees, not only for idealism, please comply with GPL, but they actually want to make money out of it. And in Paris, the first important verdict stated that even a customer can claim damages for not receiving a source code. Um, one remarkable court decision was in Berlin a couple of years ago stating that an entire firmware that, based, that is based on Linux is always derivative work, the entire firmware, the entire software on that box. Seems pretty wrong, but um, the uh, verdict um, has not been appealed in the second uh, instance. And as for the OEMs, they have woken up finally, and they are establishing open source processes and um, assess their own software and give notices. You find that sometimes in your infotainment systems or on the websites. Uh, actually, we'll even find notice requirements in the glove department if you drive a BMW or a Mini. Uh, if you're driving a Daimler, Mercedes, then you will only find a CD uh, and more material on the internet. So um, a lot of the uh, compliance that is going on is not happening in court. And I can tell you that substantial, substantial damages have been paid by suppliers to OEMs uh, because of not complying with licenses. So suppliers, of course, pass their obligations on to the next suppliers. And uh, that's when it will hit uh, smaller companies along the supply chain. So our conclusion is it's not the copyright owners to fear, but your customers. And OSS becomes a standard task and not an exotic um, event like a lightning uh, to hit you, but uh, you will just have to account for just like rain that it will happen sooner or later. So this is the time for the poll question. Roman, if you want to hand over. Uh, so everyone, uh, I will run the first poll question, so please do answer um, the, the question. I can see that uh, most of you have uh, voted, so uh, I'm going to let Chenjo comment on the results. Um, yeah, Chenjo, do you see the results? No, I don't. <laughs> okay, um, so 60% uh, voted yes often, 10% voted yes just once, 23% said uh, no. And 7%, we do not have a product. Well, that uh, I find really interesting. I had expected that uh, a lot of people would answer that they had been confronted with that demand at one time or another. Uh, yes, often seems that, that it has already become a regular task. And it seems to me that uh, it's more likely to be asked for details by a supplier, uh, by a tier one, than by an OEM. Because, um, like I said before, the OEMs were the ones spend the most time sleeping um, with the last ones to actually start with the processes. But uh, it is going on, and it takes a while uh, for the next product uh, to be assigned for open source requirements to, um, to enter the contract. So, um, so far, we've just been asking the question, why should I worry about open source compliance? And the obvious question is, yes, I have to, and uh, there's good reasons for it. And I guess the you people who are on the line right now uh, probably spend the time with open source compliance and uh, don't need to be convinced that it is necessary, but maybe you will have to convince other people. So if you do agree that uh, open source is something to spend some time on, uh, what are the next steps? The first 
thing. I mean, there's a lot of lists of steps. I think uh, Jeff will have another list of seven items. I just broke it down to one uh, to four steps. The first thing to do is find out what you are using. Build a bill of material. And uh, there's different ways of doing that. You can either ask all your uh, um, developers what open source are you using and make them fill out a uh, Excel spreadsheet. Uh, it's very unlikely that you are getting a complete picture. Another different way is to use a tool. There's free tools out there in the world that will just uh, scan the headers and uh, then make a huge list. And there's a commercial product like the one from Palamida that you all know that will also be already be also be able to find software even if the copyright statement has been edited or uh, completely deleted. So um, having a search string search is the only way to really get a full picture of what you are using. So uh, once you know what you are using, uh, you have to find out if you are actually able to comply with the licenses. Um, that's easy if you have a BSD style license or an Apache or MIT, well then you only have to um, make notice requirements. But if you are using something with a copy left like a GPL, LGPL, CPL, EPL and so on, then it could be a little more challenging to find out if you have to disclose your own source code or it's all right to just uh, uh, distribute the original source code along. So that's the way the question comes, if something is infected by, by the viral effect and it's derivative work. Uh, and sometimes, actually, it turns out that you will have to change the architecture or change uh, some components. So that's the third step, remediate, change your software. Uh, and obviously, you have to plan ahead um, sufficient time for that process. If uh, you are starting the process um, on behalf of your customer because he demands to get a source code scan, then it's very likely that you will not have enough time to make substantial changes to the uh, software architecture. And the fourth thing that will also take a lot of time is to fulfill the formal requirements when you're shipping the product. And that's the thing I want to focus on uh, with the next few slides. You see those uh, screenshots. One is from the Android phone um, with the open source license. That's that displays all the uh, license text and the notice requirements. And the other one is from the Firefox browser. If you type in the URL about uh, colon license, then it will show you what open source licenses are being used in a Firefox browser. So um, we have two tasks. One is to provide source code, original source code over that of your own software, if in fact the other task is the notice requirements. And the current challenges that we see, especially with Linux, is um, everything you have in kernel space that you change or add in kernel space should be considered as infected. Now, that's really sometimes bad news because especially drivers, hardware drivers, sometimes come as binary or with proprietary license. That should be a, that could be a problem, and we see this is um, going to be an issue in Hamburg with the ongoing litigation with VMware. We're all staring at what comes out there because that's going to be one of the, one of the first major cases about copyleft effects in Linux kernels. So kernel drivers are likely to, likely to be derivative work. It would be better to have them in user space if you can. Um, sometimes your uh, supplier, your supplier, will only give you binaries and you refuse to provide uh, source code and their own. You may have to talk to these people then. And uh, even distributing own code separately is difficult in embedded systems. So um, with Linux, you would have to uh, distribute Linux as separate works according to GPL version 2. And that's uh, possible if, you ha if you're selling a notebook computer and you have Linux pre-installed and the other software comes on a CD, or you at least uh, bring another CD with the uh, Linux distribution. But if you are selling a black box, a router, or whatever consumer product, that should be could be a challenge. And that's the reason why a lot of uh, embedded software are considered as derivative work and only being sold as open source. Well, that may be news for you, but um, well, for some people, I do know that a lot of companies still don't comply with that requirement. Um, but the ones that were got sued in Berlin have to have with AVM software. Um, notice requirements seems like like a, a stupid task. Um, notice requirements is not about can I use the software? Is it legal? Do I have to disclose my own software? It's rather about the formal requirement to give proper notice. 
and you can be sued for failing to provide notice requirements. And with Linux, one challenge is that you usually only find notice requirements for the kernel with a forward from Linux Torvalds explaining why it's using uh, GPL2 and what's all part of the kernel. However, you would need notice requirements, copyright notices for every part of the kernel, especially because the kernel developers are the ones that are responsible for most of the uh, legislation that happened in open source issues. So you would have to find out what components from the kernel you are using and compile a list of uh, attributions. Um, you might want to consider to leave out those that you are not using to um, uh, not get into trouble with those, especially if they are the ones um, that have gone to court before. Um, sometimes it's difficult to display notes if you don't have a display in an embedded system. What's the uh, solution to that? If you ask the Free Software Foundation, they say, well, then just attach the speaker. Um, I think it was not meant as a joke. They were serious about it. You have to make sure that you have the notice requirements on paper or on CD or, or in the source code that you um, put along with the software. Printed booklet or CD is uh, an option, but they get lost very easily. Um, of course, an online link is insufficient. So the next thing, question I want to ask is, what's the role of the legal department in a compliance process? Uh, we lawyers um, see a lot of time that other lawyers have difficulties dealing with open source. Once they start um, spending time with it, they come up with great ideas like putting up a blacklist or whitelist saying, okay, you can only use uh, MIT BSD style licenses and stay away from GPL. That seems like a simple solution, but not if you are a developer. So um, they say, yes, you can use, but don't use that GPL stuff because it's too risky and it's too complicated because lawyers have difficulties understanding the difference between statically linked, dynamically linked derivative work. These are not legal terms that we lawyers work with usually, at least if you're not specialized in open source law. Um, so putting up with a, coming with a blacklist or whitelist uh, usually results in that a lot of software is just being outlawed, not being used anymore, or you just bypass the legal department. So um, what we have to tell our colleagues and the companies is um, you have to be willing to learn the basics about software architecture. Um, you cannot find the solution just by reading the license, but you have to talk to tech people to understand what is going on there. So and that was... My last slide, if you have questions, call IKEA or rather someone else who knows more about the uh, questions here. So Roman, I would hand it back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. So uh, at this point, we would like to ask everyone to uh, type your questions into the uh, question box, which you can find in GoToWebinar. And we will try to be, keep it as interactive as, as, as possible. So we will uh, answer some questions uh, right now. So we're opening for questions. Okay, uh, here comes the first question. And um, will the slide decks be available afterwards for download? Yes, we'll make uh, slide decks available. Mm -hmm. I might have to take out the IKEA slide. Not sure if it's copyrighted. Uh, okay, so another question. Uh, what is your take on binary scanning only, Chandra? Uh, I will hand that over to Jeff. Um, I mean, my uh, obviously scanning binaries is much more difficult, but um, uh, Jeff will tell us that he has he does find things with Jeff with binaries. Well, thanks, thanks, Roman. Thanks, uh, The um, when it comes to binary scanning, um, you there's a lot of content in the source code world that gets lost when you compile it into a binary. There is still a significant amount of things that you can find. And, and when we do our software audits, we find significant amount of, con of open source content, commercial content in binary files. It's a really good first start, and it's sometimes the only thing you're able to do, say, that if you're dealing with code from commercial suppliers. Um, if you're working with a commercial company, it's very common that they're just going to give you a binary file. And uh, at Palomita, it's very common for us to look at that binary file with our, our, with our customers and say, let's find three things, four things, five things that were not disclosed to us by our commercial partner and bring that, bring that to their attention. Guys, you gave us a really old copy of OpenSSL. Maybe it has Heartbleed in it. 
uh, you gave us some commercial code. Do we have the rights to redistribute this, this binary with that commercial library? And so on and so on. And typically the idea in the binary world, you want to find enough to uh, kind of either call something in the question, call the disclosure list or the license list that you got from your partner or the open source team um, into question and start a dialogue. Um, it's very, very important to do binary scanning because you miss maybe 20% of your findings, if you, if you don't look at your binaries, maybe even more. Um, but it, it, it's, a, it's a good, if you're only doing binary scanning, you're, you're going to miss a lot of the content. It's a good addition to your scanning regime, but it, it, and it's a good baby step on the way to full scanning, but I wouldn't do just binary scanning because of all the things that you would, you would miss that, that only show up in source code. So good, good question. Yeah. Now, if I may add something from a legal perspective, especially from the perspective of an OEM, uh, if we scan software that's delivered from a supplier, uh, we don't need to find 100%. It's enough to find one item. Uh, if we find one item that proves that the software is not free of uh, third-party rights, uh, then we would just refuse to use the software unless they prove us what else is in there. And that's when it comes down to uh, them submitting their own tariff code base as source code to their provider, to, to a vendor like Palameda. Sure. And, and, and that's, that's a good point. And, and the thing I'll, I'll also add there is um, you should expect to find open source code in your commercial binaries. It is a, a, my experience is about 50% of every company's commercial product is made up of open source or third-party code. So it's just a given. You know, 100% of companies out there right now are using open source. They just don't know it yet, but they are. And it, it's not a surprise to find it, whether it's in source code or binaries. Um, our experience shows that most companies only disclose about 1%, maybe 10% if you're lucky, of their true third-party dependencies. So if you're, if you're given a binary from a company who's not doing, you know, not, hasn't, hasn't done a full uh, compliance review, uh, you are pretty much guaranteed that you can find an open source library in the binary that they didn't disclose to you. That's, that's something I can do kind of as a parlor trick pretty much at any time. Uh, you should have the same experience when you look at your commercial partner's code. And it's a good way to kind of uh, kick them into gear around giving you updated uh, open source disclosures. It's what's right. We, we, use, we use open source because we love it. We should uh, comply with all the obligations, whether it's the marking obligations or the source code obligations or whatever they may be. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, uh, Chen Zhou. We have another interesting question here. Um, is source code above the kernel not affected by copyleft? So, Chanjo, what, would you be able to comment on that? Uh, source code above the kernel, that would be yes. if you are in a simplified world and split Linux into user space and kernel space, then uh, one thing is for sure, if you are in kernel space, then you are most likely to be affected. But if you are in user space, it's still possible that you are affected because a lot of Linux is uh, happening in, in user space and you can link with GPL software also um, in user space. So that's really going to be difficult. Um, the question is, could be either. Jeff, what do you think about it? Yep, I, I, I agree. I think. Um, uh, I have a slide. If we, if we get if we get to my part of the presentation today, which uh, I think we'll have a couple minutes at the end, I'm going to have a slide that breaks down a typical Linux stack into sections. We call this our, our layer cake slide, and it's exactly to help dis discuss that 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 item that that question, which is uh, very often these these Linux devices, these Linux-based systems, have have many layers. So starting at the bottom with your firmware and your bootloader and then going to the kernel and kernel modules and uh, runtime command line and databases and so on and so on. Um, it, it's not simply enough to say, oh, we, we don't use GPL or we use GPL in the kernel because you probably have, depending on how deep your stack is, you may have seven different layers potentially dealing with up to seven different programming languages, all with different linking schemes, et cetera. In, in general, we do see that there's a bit of an air gap, if we call it the difference between kernel space and user land. So things that are going on in the kernel are, 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 are kind of separate from the user land space. You've heard Linus Tor Torvalds talk about um, if you use these certain APIs, you know, I don't consider that linking to the, the kernel and, and so on and so on. You know, as always, it's best to 
discuss this with your with your counsel. And that's that's a, a I think it's kind of a general rule of thumb. But that said, um, when you're in user land, there is a significant amount of great GPL licensed software that's out there. So we, we always want to make sure when we talk to our developers that they understand the kernel is not the only place with GPL licensed software. If you're using a lot of the command line tools on Linux, if you're using a lot of the multimedia related tools, pick FFmpeg, other tools like that, they're very often licensed either under the GPL or essentially the LGPL license, which may have uh, copyleft considerations for your company. So um, we, we may say that there is a split, but we still need to, to, to pay attention. Um, and every each layer of that layer cake, in some ways, needs to be looked at with your engineering team and your legal team to understand what technologies are we using, what software languages are we using, how they link to each other, and also, is anybody doing anything funny? Um, sometimes the developers are going to try to route around GPL issues. They're going to try to put in, uh, you know, some sort of a you know, whatever it may be, a shim layer or something. Um, it's it's always really important to sit down with them and really understand what they're trying to do, because um, sometimes the best option in that case is to um, maybe pick a different library, maybe just open source your layer, and so on and so on. And we'll talk a little bit in in in, in my later slides. I'll, I'll highlight that. Um, about that particular question. Thanks for that. Thank you, Jeff. We have a question on the combined work topic. Um, so is it OK to deliver a CD with a restrictive license code uh, and another one which contains the whole software or might be seen, or is it, is it uh, a combined work anyway? So Chanjo. I think this one is in your court. Yeah, I hope I got the uh, question right. You know, one of the mysteries about GPL version 2 is what did they mean with uh, distributing as, as, um, um, as, whole, as one work, uh, different uh, products? Um, a lot of, in the practice, uh, one of the common recommendations was to at least um, put two CDs or DVDs with the product, one with the open source software and the other one with the proprietary software, uh, even if that one was just an installer in binary form. That way you could at least prove that the product came with different installers. Um, I mean, obviously, just the fact that something is on the same hard disk doesn't mean that it has, it has to be derivative work. Uh, it's more about the architecture. Are they independent? I mean, obviously, uh, software and user space doesn't have to be independent because it needs an operating system. But um, if it cannot even be installed independently, then this is very much uh, a sign for it being part of probably um, infected. And uh, uh, looking at legal issues, uh, you are dealing with judges who have never written a, code, uh, a line of code before. And if you can make it at least look like different work, that would help you. And, and this is Jeff here. Now, the thing I'd like to add to that is, if you're in the position where you're even able to provide, say, your open source, uh, the source code for those modules, the disclosures, et cetera, you're doing a really good job. The fact that you're even asking that question shows that you're probably ahead of many people, many companies right now in this who are using Linux, who have not pulled together even, even their most basic, uh, say, open source distributions for the GPL and LGPL software that they're using. So if you're listening to this question and you're kind of wondering, many of the licenses, like the GPL and the LGPL, have a requirement that you, you make available to your users the, the exact source code that you use to build your product, for, at least for those libraries, and maybe more with the case of the GPL license. And my, my experience is most companies right now could not comply uh, with the request. If somebody said, I see you're using these 250 LGPL licensed libraries. I'd like the source code for exactly those libraries. Uh, you know, after this webinar, if you go ask one of your developers that question, hey, are we using LGPL software? How much? And could you comply with a request for the source code for the LGPL software tomorrow? Uh, the answer probably would be no, or well, let me get back to you, et cetera. So it's, a, it's good to start those conversations. Good to do some trial runs. We're going to pretend you got a request for a CD of open source. You know, pretend one of your customers said, "I'd like a copy of all the 
uh, source code that you are obliged to provide to us upon request and see if you could do it um, and use that to tune your system. Um, and also be, also be suspicious. Um, our, our data shows that developers are only aware of about 1% of the actual third-party code that they're using. So very often we tell people at the beginning, uh, whatever number of open source libraries you hear from your development team, add one or two zeros to the end of that to get a kind of a feeling for what your, your true dependency number should be. So thank you for that. Thank you, Jeff. And the last question before we move on with our webinar. Um, are shared objects of DLL in kernel space safe from open source concerns? So that probably be uh, Chanjo. Your question. Okay, shared objects usually would be dynamically linked. So uh, at first glance, that should be okay if uh, they are under LGPL. Uh, however, kernel is usually under GPL. So um, if there is a shared shared object in the Linux kernel that is under GPL, then just linking something dynamically will not um, keep you from creating derivative work. It's really difficult when derivative work is happening when you are linking to a library, dynamically or statically. And that's actually the reason why they came up with the LGPL, because they didn't want to have to answer the question, is it derivative or not? They just said, as long as you link it dynamically or statically with providing the, uh, the object code, uh, then you are fine. But if it's under GPL, no, usually linking either way is not okay. Thank you. So at this point, um, I would like to share with you the results of the registration survey that we have run. Um, and I will left, let, let Jeff uh, to comment on, on these results. Okay. And just one second while Roman pulls up those slides there. Okay. okay. So the first question here, uh, you know, appropriately enough for a, a, a webinar about building Linux products, do you build Linux-based products? Most of the people today are people who are building Linux-based products. Uh, the people who answered no here are most likely uh, legal, legal folks, uh, lawyers and, and similar who are, uh, who are interested in learning more about this. So, uh, not a surprise to hear that. I, I also think uh, my general rule, if you are a company who's listening today and you maybe find yourself in the no section, um, I, always, uh, I always say if you, if you are shipping a physical product these days, if you are a commercial company who ships a computer, who ships a router, who ships some sort of device that has an Ethernet plug on it, you are likely shipping Linux. Thank you, Jeff. I, I was, was going to apologize for the uh, sirens going by. Somebody, somebody hearing us talking about shipping, shipping, uh, shipping issues. But yeah, so uh, if you, my general test is if, if you're if you're shipping something that has a Wi-Fi or an Ethernet port, you should ask some serious questions about are you using Linux and how are you using Linux. Uh, next question here. Actually, Roman, how about you do it? Well, like, well, I will. Our, I will. I will read it out for you. So. Uh, have you ever experienced any IP or security vulnerability related issues when shipping Linux based products? And I should say that this, this, uh, the, most of the answers were no. Um, and this is very common uh, for us to hear this, this answer um, because uh, not until maybe a few months ago, uh, people had to deal with security issues. And as we all know, the most prominent ones include uh, such uh, security vulnerabilities as hard bleed, as uh, shell shock, as ghost and freak attack. And all of those uh, somehow appeared in the last few months. So this is probably it's something that people start seeing. Um, and the trend is becoming stronger. So maybe 12 months from now, um, two years from now, we'll see uh, the answer to this question shifting towards 
more yeses than noes. I, and Roman, I, I'd like to add something to this too, which is very often what we find is the legal teams are isolated from the vulnerability related questions. So very often the legal teams will see these libraries, these components brought in. Somebody will ask the legal team, is it okay if I use this library? Is it okay if I use this license? So we see it on the inbound side. But very often there is a separate team, a security team, who, who's been empowered to upgrade libraries, remove libraries, et cetera. And, and typically in most organizations do not have any sort of reporting mechanism back to legal or back to the OSRB. Sometimes they do, but very often it's, oh, we upgraded uh, Apache Web Server. We have uh, upgraded OpenSSL. Oh, the developers took it on their own to patch our fleet and so on and so on without reporting that back to legal. So very often we see libraries when they're most perfect, you know, when they're the top of the tree, when they're the latest version, we approve them for use. And then later on, six weeks later, six years later, somebody finds a problem with it and upgrades it or patches it. Um, we don't get that visibility. That's a, that's a great way if you're a legal team, if you do not know who your security team is, um, it's probably a good thing to go, you know, go take them out to lunch, find out who they are, what they're doing, um, get a good feeling for how they do their job, see if there's any way that you can communicate to them your, any concerns you have and they can communicate back to you um, how they patch things, how they push things out. Because in some cases, these patches need to be released. These upgraded pieces need to be released. And if they're not being tracked by your legal team or your OSRB, um, you may find yourself with a compliance issue where you've been patching code for years and not, you're not aware of it. Thank you, Jeff. So this is the next question. Do you build Linux-based products? And the answers we've, uh, uh, we've given, um, uh, sorry, the, the actual question was, uh, what are the issues that you see with Linux-based, uh, when building Linux-based products? And uh, the answers we've received were, I have no concerns uh, when building Linux-based products. My concerns are in IP compliance and GPL violations. Um, my concerns are around security vulnerabilities, such as hard glitch, shell shock, ghost, and others replied something else. And it's interesting to see that uh, uh, the majority of the audience uh, answered IP compliance and GPL violations. Is, uh, uh, and it's kind of expected. This is where we've seen uh, most of uh, the focus in a recent decade. Uh, and again, like I said, we see the trend in security vulnerabilities. Um, and the biggest question that people ask uh, today is where will be the next OpenSSL hard lead or similar vulnerability? Okay, the next, um, the next uh, question. Uh, for which primary industry do you develop products? And again, this was mainly out of uh, interest because um, you know we, we see uh, we see that the problem we're solving is uh, actual for for most most of the industries out there, um, and as we can see, the automotive uh, registrants dominate uh, uh, today's uh, audience. So, and there were some people from defense and finance. Um, again, we also see a lot of demand, obviously, in ISV, but maybe not for that specific. Uh, webinar. So at that point, I would like uh, to turn it over uh, to Jeff, as this was uh, the last question. Okay. Okay. I'm going to show okay. my screen here. Thank you, Roman. And um, we, uh, let's see, just check on time here. It looks like we have about uh, 20 minutes or so here left. So what I'll do is I'm going to cut out some of these slides and get into the, the, the meat of what we call the, the uh, Linux layer cake, uh, the, the different layers that we see. So thank you again for, for joining us today. What I'd like to talk about is skip over some of the things that we've talked about already, which is you're using a lot more open source than, than you may be uh, realizing. You know, great, great rule of thumb. Ask your developers how many libraries they can tell you. Add, a, add two zeros to that. It's also a good test if you're a company and you haven't produced a bill of materials in a while. Go ask your VP of engineering uh, to get you one. And if it takes more than a day, 
um, that may be a sign that they're scrambling, that they don't have it at their fingertips. So do, why do we practice? Why do we do drills? It's so that we can um, improve the processes inside. Okay. So what are the things that we're seeing in the code base? So one of the questions previously was about what about, what about binaries? What if we're just shipping binaries? Well, there's many indicators of open source. So when you when you are your customers and you're looking at whatever your company provides to them, there's things that they can see. They can see raw copyright in the in the source. They can see open source license text, whether it's in the binary, the source, or you provide it in the documentation. There's exact matches. There's search terms that they might be looking for, such as the the term free software, maybe a, a person's name, maybe the word stolen from, or something like that. The binary files we talked about, email addresses, URLs, and even source code fingerprints. If, if something is provided to somebody in source form, they can take a look and say, Where, where's all this code coming from? This is what I refer to as the stew. We, we ship our customers around the world, whatever industry you're in, a stew of other people's work. Maybe half of it's yours, half of it's coming from the open source and commercial communities. All of these are things that both you can use to find your use of open source, but also your customers are starting to, to do. Is it, as they receive binary blobs, as they receive products, they start doing analysis to see what's going on. Okay. And people aren't tracking it. Like maybe that's why people are on the, on the call today, but in general, 90% of the components are not tracked, which makes it very easy. If you are if you're on the other side of uh, receiving the code, and you say, I just want to find one problem, two problems, three problems, it's pretty much trivial to find open source usage in a product that um, has not been disclosed. Uh, we're starting to see this being used as part of uh, uh, defenses in business-to-business uh, -business lawsuits where somebody does a breach of contract one way, and on, on the defense, people are starting to use the fact that open source and GPL software was not properly uh, disclosed to them as a countersuit. I would not be surprised if we see that happen more and more as, um, as uh, awareness of this, this problem grows. And, and, and many organizations, especially in the Linux space, automotive, defense, any, you know, anything that ships with an Ethernet port or a Wi-Fi port on it, has a very deep software stack. And let's, let's talk about what, what is mixed up there. Well, you're going to have your Linux-related technologies, often with GPL licensing. You're going to have um, basically what I call the, the, kind of the, the five other major pieces of infrastructure that are great places to start, especially if you're a legal, a legal person or an engineering manager and you want to get a, 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 good, a good feeling for, um, you know, in some ways, the, the most serious issues, the most significant parts of your code base. Go through, talk to your team and say, do we know where we got our Linux kernel from? Did we download it? If so, which site? Did we build it? Did we get some sort of predefined stack from some other organization? Do we even know who this person is? Did we did we get it off of BitTorrent or something like that? These are all these are all questions that somebody in the organization knows the answer to, but, but rarely is it written down. So where did we get our Linux? Did we build it ourselves? Did we get it from a commercial vendor? And so on and so on. What about cryptography? There's there's many legal requirements about disclosing your your cryptographic components in, in many countries. Great question to ask your team. This is where OpenSSL is going to come up and, and related libraries. So when you talk to your team, tell me, where, wh what are we using for cryptography? What are our encryption libraries? What do we, what do we use maybe, or related, what are we using for hashing? And so on and so on. Um, they might not know the answer when you say, tell me about what open source you're using. But if you ask them a very pointed question about cryptography or compression libraries or multimedia components, and you say, like, I, what I mean is FFmpeg. What I mean is OpenSSL. Uh, you're going to get a much better response to your question. So it, it's great to come in prepared, know the types of stacks that, that we're discussing here, know some examples of common stacks to start the, start the, um, the discussion. But, you know, if you talk to your team, tell me about the application platforms you're using. They might not know quite what you're talking about, but if you say, what I mean is Tomcat or Jetty or JBoss, oh, 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 and they'll start listing off what they're using. Same thing for databases, a very commonly overlooked thing. You know, everybody's using a database these days, and it may be a small embedded database like SQLite or Derby. It may be a commercial-grade database like Oracle, which everyone knows 
or something in the middle, MySQL, Postgres, maybe it's a new style like MongoDB. Great to come in with these questions and then keep asking because you might not just be using one of these technologies. We say, what database are we using? Somebody might say, MySQL. Oh, and also SQLite and also Derby because different parts of your stack are going to have different um, databases. So great way to start. Um, I like calling it the conference room effect. Get the right people in a conference room. You know, get them pizza. Get them. Get them whatever you uh, whatever wherever, whatever works to get people in the conference room, and start asking them those questions. Talk to people. Talk to different people. Do some code scans. Obviously, check with commercial contract people to see if they know where the commercial things are coming in from. And and look at your code base with two different sets of eyes. One is the top down view, which is looking at what we call the big rocks the large, well-known libraries, the well-known monolithic packages. Uh, look for things. Where is BusyBox? Where is Linux kernel? Where is FFmpeg? Where are all the RPMs? That's a great way to get a feeling for the, the biggest pieces of your bill of materials. And just start counting. You know, day one, day two, day three. That'll give you a feeling for, for, for how complex your product is, where these things are found. This is the great way to get ahead of somebody saying, you guys are using BusyBox and um, you don't know it. Um, you don't, don't find yourself down in the weeds. Don't find yourself looking at a single line of source code yet until in some ways you've, you've dealt with a lot of your top level um, dependencies. Um, there's also what we call bottom up analysis, which is where when you go back, back here, you, you move your way from the file level or the snippet level up. And this is where you might find subcomponent problems, a single file under a very strong license. Maybe it's the GPL v3. Maybe it's a Faro. Maybe it's commercial. Uh, a single file out of 100,000 files that may be a problem. So first, first option is to go down and do the top-down analysis, find the big rocks, um, and then do the bottom-up analysis. And it's very common to see this happen basically at the same time. I always recommend in some ways to start with a top-down analysis, spend a couple of days getting a feeling for um, some of the big questions, and then start doing some targeted bottom-up analysis in places where you don't expect to find things like GPL source, source code or a FARO source code. Um, you're going you're to keep doing these basically as long as you're writing software. There's always going to be no, new code coming in. There's always going to be um, new potential licenses, uh, security concerns, et cetera. Um, but it, it, it's a very common thing to sit down and say, let's talk about our architecture. What is our front end? What is our database? What, is our, um, what are we using for JavaScript frameworks? Talk to the developers. Talk to the QA people. Talk to the security people. And the same thing for bottom-up analysis. Target the various things, cryptography, compression, multimedia, um, certain very low-level components that we always know have um, software vulnerabilities. OpenSSL is always at the top of the list. So great library. It drives the Internet. I'm sure 80 to 80 percent and 90 percent to 100 percent of companies are, are using OpenSSL in one form or another right now. Um, but it, but it's, a, it's a target for hackers. It's a target for um, finding new attack vectors. So always be looking for OpenSSL. Always be looking for these other things like Zlib, LibTip, LibPNG. These are some of the most common libraries that are out there, and they're targeted because they are so common. And they're great libraries, but you just need to know where they are. Okay. Good question to always ask your team. What is the oldest library in your code base? Is it one year old, five years old, 10 years old, 20 years old? And sometimes the answer will surprise you. Um, I, I commonly come across 20-year-old software on Linux and Windows um, company scans where it was checked in a long time ago and it's been carried forward year after year after year. Those are great places to look and say, you know, should we be updating this? Something that's 20 years old, is this something that is still appropriate for us to be shipping? Okay. And th this is the slide I talked about before. We, we call this the layer cake slide. Um, the idea here is when you are a legal person and you're talking with your development team, or you're a development team and you're talking to your legal person, we, we've entered the world where there are multiple layers that in many ways are independent of each other. They, they almost can be completely different systems. They have different policies. 
They have different um, ways of delivering the code. They have different programming languages that are involved with them, and, and so on and so on. That, that basically, when you talk to your talk to the two different teams there, you you almost need to have this printed out and and pointing to it when you talked about the various libraries. So if you are shipping some sort of Linux device, maybe it's your maybe it's your um, car computer, maybe it's a router, maybe it is a uh, a thermostat on the wall that that's running an embedded operating system or a small version of Linux. When you are talking about the various pieces, you need to point and say, okay, are we talking about things that are inside the Linux kernel? Are we talking about something maybe even lower level than that, like the bootloader or the firmware? Are we talking about changes that we made to the kernel? Or maybe drivers that we've added. So we've, we've gotten some new piece of electronics that we've added to our, our, our Linux-based device. Maybe it's a, a brake controller. Maybe it is a, a radio. Maybe it is a, you know, a, a, some sort of sensor or actuator. And you're going to create a new driver for that. Or maybe your commercial team that you're working with from outside delivered you a driver. These are the things that, to point to and say, okay, this is a, a, a loadable kernel module. This is, a, this is a driver for Linux. We built it. We got it from our commercial company. We got it from the internet, and so on and so on. And then above that, you're going to find system libraries and frameworks. This is where things like OpenSSL comes in, where things like databases like MySQL or the Java runtime. Things in the Java runtime are not going to affect your Linux kernel. Things in your Linux kernel drivers are probably not going to affect your firmware, and so on and so on. So as you talk about the intellectual property issues that are there, the licenses, the files, it's good to have a slide like this printed out, uh, have people go up to the whiteboard and point to the various levels. Okay, Are we talking about... The, Many times, the, the very top level only, the yellow box, which is your proprietary, typically a proprietary piece on top of your Linux stack. Very often, that's what people want to protect, if we can use that word, which is keep it closed source, um, keep things away, that, that you know, comply with all the licenses, do the right thing. That's why, we're, that's why we're talking about this today, is to basically use the libraries that we can respect their obligations and licenses. So up in the yellow box, typically, Many commercial companies are going to stay away from GPL software. They're going to mindfully use LGPL software. They're perhaps going to stay away from a Faro or a Creative Commons share alike, and so on and so on. But that yellow box, again, is unlikely to be affected by your kernel changes and vice versa. You may still have a licensing problem in your device, but they often are, are separate. You may be using Java up in the yellow box, your Linux kernel is going to be written in C. Your database may be written in Erlang, and so on and so on. And it's very, it's very likely that they're not linked to each other. They're not talking to each other at all, except through kind of the common uh, uh, just runtime you know, pipes and command lines and things like that. So, um, when if you are a Linux-based product company, print out this slide. Talk to your team. Have people point to where things are on the slide. And you will find that there are some gray areas between components. You may be doing some really strange things. But in general, figure out where you are in this layer cake and make your different policies based on that. You may, you may be completely willing to open source everything from the driver level down to the bare metal because you're not, maybe you're not a hardware company. You're, just, you're, hard, you're, you're, you're buying commodity hardware. You're making it work with Linux. But you don't care if people have your changes or not. Your, your real secret sauce is up above that level. That's a very common thing for people. Other companies are going to say our secret sauce is down there at the driver level. We need to make sure that we're, we're doing the right thing around kernel drivers and things like that. So in the interest of time, I want to leave some questions, uh, time for questions here. I want to talk a little bit about um, picking alternatives. Um, in many cases, GPL v2 or v3 is completely appropriate and expected and is the best software for the job. Um, I, I, uh, when you're looking at the Linux kernel, it is going to be GPL v2. There is nothing you can do to change that. Um, you can maybe pick a different operating system like BSD if you want a different licensing scheme. But if you're using Linux, GPL v2 is, is where you're going to be. Um, if you are going to expect something to be closed source, maybe you're making a kernel module that is proprietary. Maybe you're making a, a command line tool or something like that that is proprietary or, or has a different licensing scheme. Um, you are likely required to remove any of the GPL license code that you find in these closed areas. 
And picking an appropriate alternative is difficult for many companies. And I see a lot of companies um, make a mistake here. So, uh, you know, the first thing is your development team is the best team to pick an alternative. They live in this code. They know, they know the, the product inside and out. And if you say, you know what, we can't use library A because of problems, what else, what's your second choice? They're the best people to, to pick this. You, you do need to give them some guidelines, help them with some, uh, some good licenses, tell them some licenses that you want to stay away from with the expectation that they still may come back with a license that's not on your list and you need to re respond to that. But you can always say, we prefer the following licenses. Maybe that may be MIT, BSD, Apache, or maybe even commercial. We, we'd like you to stay away from XYZ. That can help them make a, make a, make a, 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 a choice. If an open source project cannot be found, you know, there's often where people say, I guess we're going to build it. Maybe you will make your own open source uh, uh, library and give it away to the community under an MIT license. Maybe you're just going to keep it proprietary. That's a very common choice that people make. And then you know, rarely people will provide commercial licensing of GTL license code. You know, in some ways you can always ask, but you can, you can assume the closer they are to the kernel, the less likely they'll either be able to relicense it or have any interest in relicensing it. It is always something that's a tool in our toolbox, but um, my, my, my general feeling is if you see something that's GTL v2, you should respect that choice. It's always, you know, if, if you haven't used that library before, well, it doesn't hurt to say we're thinking about using your library. Is there a chance we can get it under a, a commercial license or a BSD license or an Apache license? Can't hurt to ask that. If you've already started building it, that's a much different question. You, you, you may just need to remediate it, fix it, and, and move on uh, without causing problems for yourself. Um, do not let your team try to relicense the project without permission. I see this happen all the time where somebody says, oh, it's GPL. I'm going to change it to LGPL. I'm going to remove this. I'm going to remove that. I'm just going to take these little bits out of it, and it's good. Um, it is very common for developers to think that they can do that, and your job as the legal team is to make sure that they, they, know, they know exactly what not to do. In a vacuum, developers sometimes make bad choices, and if, if you don't make it clear what's expected and appropriate, uh, you, you, you shouldn't be surprised to find out that a developer did something, what they thought was the right thing, but it turned out to have a, a legal implication for you. So do give them a do not do list when it comes to open source and licenses and um, copying and pasting and things like that. So that, that's, um, that's what I, I think what we have the time for today. I think we have a couple minutes here left for questions. So um, if you have any questions about this, please uh, please type them into the box on the right-hand side. Okay, we, we have a couple of questions here. Um, so, okay, here's a question. Um, okay, can the offer to provide copies of open source code uh, to requesters be time limited? Again, um, can the offer to provide copies of open source code to requesters be time limited? So, so I'm not a lawyer, so I don't think this is legal advice, um, but I, I do believe that many of these licenses have, uh, uh, you know, let's say the GPL and the LGPL have a three-year clip. It says a written offer, good for three years to provide the source code. Um, that, that's for the GPL and LGPL. Other licenses I do not believe have those time restrictions. So you may find yourself, you know, quote unquote, required to fulfill that obligation for, for many years. But basically, as long as you're shipping that software to a customer, um, as long as you're an active, active de developer and you're an active company actually deploying it, um, it'd be kind of surprising these days to see somebody you know, not shipping code every month, every year, um, and, and be on the hook for that obligation. But uh, uh, there is, some of the licenses do have some restrictions, like a three-year clip. I don't know, Chanyo, if you have anything to add there. Okay, maybe, maybe one more question here. Um, so, um, so is the understanding that applications that use Linux libraries are not affected uh, thanks to the GPL linking exception? Uh, so is this understanding correct or wrong that uh, Linux libraries are not affected, uh, those ones that have GPL linking exception? So say that one more time, Roman. 
so, so the question is, uh, if GPL libraries that have a license uh, with a GPL exception mm -hmm. uh, are not affected uh, by the, the general viral clause of the GPL? Mm -hmm. I think uh, I can answer that. Um, there are, there's a couple of linking exceptions, for example, the class path exception, and they basically bring GPL to the same result as with LGPL. So if you link against those kind of uh, licenses, um, usually you will not have a copy left effect. That's the point of it. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, maybe very quickly another question. Um, so what about trademarks in Linux uh, distributions coming from the uh, user uh, license? Very often uh, you're not allowed to redistribute. Is it GPL compatible? So, Janjo, maybe this is this is your question since it's yeah, uh, a uh, bit of a legal. Yeah, can you get the first part? Uh, yeah, sure. So, not allowed. What what, uh, what about trademarks in Linux distributions that uh, come from the user ag license agreements, EULAs? Uh, very often, uh, you as a user not allowed to redistribute, uh, and is it GPL compatible in this case? Oh, that's a really interesting topic. Um, there's usually a conflict whenever it comes to copyright, trademarks, and patents. Uh, usually GPL uh, license would not be GPL com uh, compatible if it had restrictions from either trademarks or patents. So the question is, uh, was it properly be licensed in the first place? Um, but even if it was not properly licensed, uh, that does not mean you can just use the software as, as you like. So usually when there is a copyright or say a trademark, uh, it is a stronger right, and uh, you would have to stick with that. Mm -hmm. and, and an interesting case on this was if you look at uh, the, 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 the browser, the Mozilla browser, which was rebranded as Ice Weasel on one of the Linux distributions. This was over a trademark issue and, and a branding issue. So if you're interested in reading a little bit more about a, a specific trademark case and how Linux distributions handled it, Look at Mozilla and Ice Weasel, Weasel like the, like the animal, and uh, you can see some really interesting commentary about um, trademarks and rebranding and um, passing on information to your, your users. And um, I think we're running out of time here, but I did notice that there was a series of questions about linking, so dynamic linking versus static linking. Um, that's kind of a big topic. We, we have a, I believe we have a webinar that's posted right now, which was called Just Enough Computer Science for Lawyers, which, which has a section on linking, and so the video and audio should be on the website. But we, uh, we also, it's probably time that we redo that, that webinar anyway, so if you're interested, um, do let us know, and we can make sure, get you on the list to, um, to walk through that, that piece. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. So I would like to thank everyone who joined us today, and especially our guest, Chen Zhou. Um, we will be conducting similar webinars in the near future, so please stay tuned. Um, and I think the next one is on uh, May uh, 12th. Uh, it will be uh, a, in a US-friendly time zone. Uh, you'll be, um, here's a link for everyone, uh, so you can register for this uh, specific webinar. Um, actually, this one is uh, the one that Jeff recommended, but we'll also share the, the other link. Um, and the title is uh, Preparing for the M&A Exit uh, by, and it will be uh, done by Heather Maker, uh, the lawyer. Um, so, um, always happy to uh, have all of you uh, here with us. So, looking forward uh, for uh, future uh, webinars and seminars and uh, user groups. Um, thank you for joining and we'll see you soon.